Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. I'm very pleased to be with you today, and I want to talk about leadership in the context of uh, overcoming uncertainties and setbacks. This is the, the place I was born and bred in. I was in the jungle of Borneo. And this photograph that you see here, uh, that's my late father who died of Alzheimer's a few years ago. And you see the other photograph, if you look very closely at the photograph, you see some human skulls there. My great, great ancestors were headhunters. Their hobby in life is to go to another village and chop people's head and take their skulls and put them as trophy. I'm okay, by the way. And uh, when I want to talk about how to transform an organization to achieve big, fast results in the context of setback and also dealing with uncertainties, I have a very simple equation. And the equation is you have to change the way in which you lead the organization. I call it transformational leadership. But on top of that, you require everyone in the organization to embrace a new way of working. And if you have the two things put together, that means the leadership is behaving in a manner that's transformational, and the staff are working in an entirely new way, then you get big, fast results. And I want to talk about the six secrets, and if you embrace some of this, and hopefully you take some lessons from the insights, and then you apply them in your own life, and hopefully you become better leader in your own right. I have been very fortunate uh, that I've been able to meet many of these people that are here, and uh, there's one thing in common, Steve Jobs, and uh, if you, you see Jack Ma and so Arnold Schwarzenegger, and obviously this man as well, Usain Bolt. Every single one of these people, they have one thing in common. They really believe in setting impossible target. Let me define what I mean by impossible target. Impossible target means something that you cannot achieve based on the current way of doing it. I repeat, eh? impossible target means a target that you set. When you recognize that you will never be able to achieve this based on the current way of doing it, and therefore it will force you to find a new way to do it. It will force you to think outside the box. It will force you to figure out how the organization has to do it. And every single one of those lead, uh, great leaders and iconic um, athletes that I, I, I talked about set Olympics targets. But of course, the difficulty is that to set up Olympics target, people will have fear of failure. And I would say today, most of us human beings, 90% of us, will die and get buried underground not fulfilling our full potential because of the fear of failure. So what do we do? We set mediocre target, very normal targets. And these targets, we know we can achieve it. We don't have to change. We don't have to transform. We don't have to put new ways of working because the current way of working can achieve it. You know what the saddest part of doing that? Is that you are consigning your life towards a life of mediocrity. You will never achieve your full potential. So my recommendation is as leaders, all of you need to think about setting for yourself impossible targets. This guy here, Hussein Bolt, and I had dinner with him at a Nobu restaurant in Kuala Lumpur. And uh, the most interesting thing was, somebody asked him the question, Mr. Bolt, what is in your mind when you are at the starting block ready to run? His response was completely shocking. He said, I'm only thinking of what I am going to eat when I finish the race. Do you know why? Nine months prior to every race, he goes through a strict diet regime. Just cannot go and eat nasi lemak as any time he, he feels like it. He cannot just simply go and have his enjoy life and do many things. So that means sacrifice. So when you set Olympic targets, there are some sacrifices that has to be made. You cannot set Olympic target, but you say, oh, I want to relax. Lah. I don't want to do difficult things. But when you set Olympic targets, there's a lot of sacrifices that you have to make. Otherwise, you'll never achieve, you achieve them. I want to tell a little story about my, my time uh, when I was in, in uh, London. I was based in London. You know, I'm, some of you may know me. I'm a big fan of Chelsea Football Club. We're not doing very well today. Uh, we are really struggling. 
But uh, Shell, I had a job there, fantastic job. I was the vice president for retail and business development consultancy uh, based in London. Beautiful house that Shell rented for me in the, the house in Cobham. And uh, I had my own private tennis court and I had four Italian gardeners. And then uh, my son studied at Parkside School. Next to the school, Parkside School was a training ground for Chelsea Football Club. I kind of told my wife, maybe let's not return to Malaysia. Like we'll make London home. And that was what was. Unfortunately, one day, my boss said to me, Idris, I want you to go back to Malaysia. We have a shell company in Malaysia that lost money for 10 straight years. We don't know what to do with it. We want you to go back to Malaysia uh, to fix the company and try to turn it around. This is really uncertain and real setbacks. This is a huge setback for us. And so uh, I was just thinking, wow, I have to abandon Cobham, all these nice things that I live here. Now I have to go back and live in Tamantun, which is what I did on the 1st of June, 2003, I turned up in my job. And so, you know, when I take a new job, the first thing that I do in a new role is to gather everybody in a room. So I had 300 over staff in the room and we, uh, we had a discussion. I told them, ladies and gentlemen, we will make a profit here. And I set the impossible target and we will make a profit. Every single year, we will make new record. Every single year, new record profit. So there was one guy in the crowd. His name is Hans. He's a Dutchman. He said, uh, it is you'll never make money in this company because, uh, you know, it's impossible to make money. And so he said, I want to have a bet with you. And the wager is if you make a profit, I'll pay you 100 ringgit. You know, Dutch people, they don't make very big bets, very small bets. I said, bets accepted. In the first six months, he lost. Then I told him, Hans, give me the 100 ringgit. I want a letter from you as well. So he gave me the 100 ringgit and with a letter, we framed it in the hallway. So if you go to the Shell office today, you can still see the 100 ringgit plastered on the hallway in Bintulu, as well as his letter. And uh, this was my special officer, his name is, is Ha. I told this story, you know, so one day he and I were invited to Bintulu, to the Shell office to speak to the staff. He said, you know, boss, I would like to go and see that 100 ringgit that you talk about and the letter from Hans. So that is the ringgit, you can see it on the wall. That is the letter from Hans. My friend Isha took a photograph of this and put this on his tweet. He said, this story that the boss talked about is real. And this is the, what happened. The first six months, we made 10 million net profit after tax, the first six months. The subsequent year, we made 265 million net profit after tax. In the third year, we made a record profit of 500 million 509 million net profit after tax. So I remember in, uh, in December 2003, I wanted to reward the staff because it's the first time in 10 years that we made a profit. You may recall Apple released iPod at that time. So iPod was a new product of desire. People really wanted that. So I remember buying something like more than 300 iPods in all the Apple stores in Kuala Lumpur. I bought all of them practically. And I gave to everybody in, in the company, including my driver, including the tea lady, everybody. Because I wanted to send a signal that we have made it. And we are going to keep on taking on new impossible targets. You will see the numbers there. And so some of the incredible things we did was I wanted to challenge all the refineries in Europe. I wanted to win the competition to become the green fuels at the Athens Olympics in 2004. And nobody believed it was possible because we have to send our, our diesel by ship and compete with all the refineries in Europe. They don't have to spend money shipping them. We have to spend money on insurance. They don't have to do that. And so they thought that we were going to fail. But ladies and gentlemen, I'm pleased to say that we won it. Shell MDS in Bintulu, we were the official uh, green fuels for the Athens Olympics. Why was I so keen on doing that? It was very simple. I just knew that if we win this, we have a massive branding. People know about our product. So people knew about our product because it's green. And so when we were selling the product in Germany, we even were able to get Gerhard Schroeder, the chancellor of Germany, to come there and launch the product for when we were selling in Germany. At that point, I can tell you, my job was very easy because our product was selling like hotcakes. 
Let me digress a little bit now, why our product was so unique. We were the only company in the whole world that produced kerosene and diesel from natural gas. No company in the whole world up to that point ever produced diesel and kerosene from natural gas. They all come from crude oil. And that was why they were dirty and not clean. And because of that, there was a premium associated with the product. And so we were the pioneers in doing this in the whole world. Uh, so that's why it was very, very interesting. And people wanted our product. So many customers wanted our product from Germany, uh, from the whole of Europe, from Japan, from uh, Taiwan, from Korea. At that point, in my third year, our problem was how to, how to sell the product because we don't have any more to sell. And so we started migrating whoever pays us the highest premium for our product got our product. If you don't pay a highest premium for it, you don't get our product. That's how we have record, record prices. Um, the second secret of leadership is about being able to anchor the organization on the true north, the right measure of success. And then you can prioritize. The biggest problem in any organization, including public health, is people's leadership's inability to prioritize. They want to do everything. In fact, politicians are worse. The politicians promise everything, the moon and the sun, everything during the campaign. But you know, in life, uh, you don't have money to do everything. You don't have the resources to do everything. So you have to prioritize. So leadership must be able to prioritize based on the true north the measure of where the organization is going. So I believe in four steps that you need to take. In anything, if you run an organization, and like, you know, in my corporate world, we produce a profit and loss statement for the whole company, but I wanted to break down the PNL to the lowest common denominator. I will come back, describe a little later. Identify the initiatives that are required to improve the profit and loss statement, and then conduct a lab to do this, establish a transformation unit. Some of you may remember, I was working in, in Malaysia Airlines at one time. And this was the front page of the uh, New Stress Time on the 1st of December 2005, when I was appointed as a CEO of Malaysia Airlines. You see the photograph there, I look quite young then. And uh, I remember when I went to Malaysia Airlines, I told everybody, I gathered everybody in the room, day one, and I told them that we're going to turn around this company and make it profitable. At that point, it was the worst financial year in the history of Malaysia Airlines. We had 1.3 billion ringgit of loss. That's only for nine months. If it was a full 12 months, it would have been 1.6 billion loss. And so uh, I told them that we're going to turn around this company and make record profits. And of course, people said it cannot be done. So the joke they had was MAS stood for Mati Anak Sarawak. Because they said, I'm from Sarawak. This guy has no experience in oil and in, in the aviation sector. He sure lose money. But I told them MA stood for Masala Akan Selesai. So you must have confidence in what you intend to do. Otherwise, nobody follow you. We had a cash crisis. We had a profit crisis like I mentioned before. So what did I do? The first thing I did was... I brought in the finance manager inside my room, and thank you, Azmil. And I told Azmil, look, I want you guys to reconstruct our whole profit and loss statement, break them down into flight profit and loss statement. I can tell you, at that point, no airlines in the world ever do this. That means for every flight, when the plane departs Kuala Lumpur, arrives in London Heathrow, in one hour's time, I want to know how much money we made on that flight, how much money we lost in that flight. Because when I knew it, then we make changes for the next flight. The pricing structure, the cost structure, we make direct impact. And so they nearly all fell off the chair because it's impossible to do. They said 110,000 profit and loss statement for every flight in a year. But we did that. The interesting thing is when we did that, we found out as an example, we had two flights going to the London Heathrow. Every single day for the whole year, the same two flights were making money. Every single day for the whole year, the same two flights was losing money. What's the solution? Get rid of those two flights that was losing money. We didn't change the pricing. 
We, t- we didn't change nasi lemak. We didn't change the, uh, the branding. We didn't do anything different. We just made money immediately the very next day. We would have never known this if we didn't break the PNL to the lowest common denominator. We also found that there were some flights, we were making so much money, we don't have enough planes flying on those routes. So we diverted the planes that we cut the routes, uh, the flights to into serving those areas. So there were so many things we found. And many of you are doctors, and I can tell you, the doctors will say the more precise the diagnosis, the more precise the prescription. You cannot say because somebody is having temperature, high fever, that the solution must be Panadol. Panadol is symptom. And so to me, in running businesses, you must dissect everything you do into the lowest common denominator. In this case, the profit and loss statement at that level so that you know exactly what to do. And so uh, the, my first year in Malaysia Alliance, we didn't make a profit. We nearly broke even. We had uh, our, the, the, the loss cut down to 74 million loss. You know, we had 1.3 billion the year before. And there were criticism, I said, Idris made money because he sold building. To be clear, we didn't make money when we sold building. We sold the building, headquarters, what did I do that for? To pay for redundancy. Because I need to remove 3,000 people from the workforce because we had far too many people in the airlines. But I didn't want to make anybody forcibly redundant. So we introduced a mutual separation scheme. I want people who volunteer to go, and if they go, we pay them good money. And we sold our building for 130 million. We used that money to pay for people to go. In my first two months, 3,056 people left the company on a voluntary basis. And so we didn't make money in our year one. And we, uh, second year, we made record profit. That's still the record to this day. No body has ever broken the record. We made 840 million net profit after tax. Even in 2009 and 2010, we had the financial crisis and we had record oil price. We still were profitable. By the way, in the 2010, this was I was on invited on to the board of IATA. The IATA is a is a it's a group of all the, the airline CEOs. We meet together uh, to discuss common things within the industry. You look at this, when $100, that was the price of fuel at that time. Delta lost 6.3 billion US dollars. Northwest lost 4.1 billion US dollars. And so you can see the losses were phenomenal. Ryanair, KLM, Air France, Japan Airlines, Korean Air, EVA Air, all of them saw red ink. But I'm proud to say that even when it was very tough, we were one of the 5% of the airlines in the world that was profitable. Malaysia Airlines was profitable. Southwest was profitable. SIA, Singapore Airlines was profitable too. So I'm very proud of the team because even in uncertain times, in the face of setbacks, you can succeed. And this is because we were really focused on the flights that were profitable and the ones unprofitable, we fixed them every single day and we knew what we were doing. I want to talk now about the third secret of transformational leadership in dealing with uncertainties. This is the word called discipline of action. The term here is the word discipline in action. Not just thinking about it, not just talking about it, but really acting on it and doing something about it. In my dictionary, there are only three things that you need to do in exercising discipline or action. If you say this is the plan, whatever is the plan, you must do it relentlessly. That means D, do it relentlessly. M is to monitor it continuously. I, I have to have a dashboard. In this dashboard, every week, the leader in, my, in the case for me and the management team, we can see who has done what during the week. So if you have not done it, it will be marked at red on the traffic light on the dashboard. And if you have done it, it's green. If you only done half of it or partially, it's amber. Why do I want to know this every Friday? Because I can spoil the weekend. I ask, all I need to do is, if you haven't done it, if your, your traffic light is red, I send you a very nice message. This thing that you did this week, it's red. Last week, it was red. What are you going to do differently on Monday so that next Friday, 
it becomes green. That is when all hell break loose. Everybody is in the office. His department heads, he brings everybody and they start finding solutions to it. This is very important. And I believe that when you start that, people start solving problems. In running any organization, whether it's business, whether it's a government ministry, you have problems. Every day you have problems. So people must sit down there and solve problems. In solving problems, I have an escalation method. The escalation method, the department has solved the problem within, within one week. If they cannot solve it after three, uh, three weeks, and then uh, it gets escalated to the department heads. If the department heads cannot solve it, and then it move into the manager, and finally get into the CEO. The key here is that you must never let problem under the carpet. You must take the problem, put it on the table for people to solve. Leadership is about solving problem. If you're not involved in solving problem as a leader, you're not worth the salt. I want to talk now about another secret of leadership to deal with uncertainties. When you take a new journey, you have to remember this, the idea of situational leadership. This idea is not original from me, it's Ken Blanchard. If you look at situational leadership and Google it, you'll find lots of material about this. Ken Blanchard believes any new journey that you take an organization through, they go through four phases. Phase one is the orientation phase. At the orientation phase, the new leader comes and set the new direction for everybody. And when he sets the new direction, there's a lot of excitement. People are really excited. Just like when I went to Malaysia Airline, they were quite excited because this guy is new, he's fresh, and the morale level seems to be high, that's a red line. But the productivity line is very low, which is the black line. Your direct, your, your style of leadership in dealing with this organization at this stage is really what I call directive style. That means not too much democratic discussion, but really getting people to say, this is what we intend to do. You have to tell them where you're heading. And not so much empowering, because at the beginning, if you want to use empowering style there, that's chaos. Can you imagine if you tell an organization, you the leader, you come out there, ladies and gentlemen, this is the, the state we're in. We have a problem in the organization. I want to empower you to go forth and solve the problem and do whatever you please. That's chaos. That's anarchy. But you have to set clearly the pathways and where you are heading, how you intend to do it. And I give a little simple example. Most of us have children. When they were crawling, you don't tell a kid who is crawling, you're empowered to go to the kitchen. They are full of knives there, you can do whatever you please. The word cannot and no is a very important word for babies. But you know, later stage, if you can see stage three and four, when they have gained the competence, the productivity, they are already clever and good at doing it, then only you start empowering. And so I want to touch on uh, stage two. In stage two, when you go through a transformation journey, you will go through a period of dissatisfaction when people are not happy with the change process that you're bringing. When you are a leader, you're bringing in big change in the organization, people will resist the change. And that is called a dissatisfaction phase. Your leadership style continue to be directive, but you need to exercise empathy in the way you explain it to people. And it's very, very important to, to do this. And so the key here is this, as people now find solutions to it, you need to then begin to empower, let them go. That's the time when you tell people, you start grooming leaders. In stage three and four, you must identify people in your organization that you believe can replace you. Leadership is about grooming leaders, making sure that they can grow to step into your shoes. I used to have a boss in Shell, his name is Chris Knight. And we were talking about grooming leaders. There was one guy in the crowd during a session. He said, Chris, 
we have a huge problem looking for talents because there's not enough talents in organization. And so that is why it's very difficult to get succession planning. And his response was rather curt. He said, you know, the graveyard is full of indispensable people. When they were alive, they told everybody, when I die, the world will stop running. But you know what? When they died, they got buried in the ground. The world continues to thrive. So never think of yourself as indispensable. And there are other people down there in your organization you should groom. Let them learn to pick out the role. Leadership resilience comes through with your ability to identify a very big bench of leaders that can take over from you, particularly when you get down to uh, the stage four where people know what to do and you stop telling them what to do because you are empowering them to run with it. So those are very, very important instructive tools. I find this to be very, very useful tool. And, uh, and I want to touch base on uh, and a very simple example that is in, uh, in the Bible as well as also in the Quran. Huh? Moses and Nabi Musa, when he led his people uh, from Egypt to go to the promised land. Do you think Moses or Nabi Musa told his people, let's have a democratic discussion, which direction in the desert we are going to go? There's no way he could have succeeded in convincing. He had, he had no map, he had no GPS. And if he had a democratic discussion, they wouldn't have followed him. But he basically was directive. He told them, this is the path we're going through. He looked the path, he was very confident, so they believed him. So they followed him. And so, but you know, in the story, they got lost. They were spending 40 years in the desert, their satisfaction. They were very unhappy with him. But then throughout there, he continued to be directive. But in the desert, they were able to then find solutions to the problem. Why I'm telling the story is because Moses or Musa, he did not actually succeed in bringing his people to the promised land. He passed it on to Joshua or Yeshua. He passed it on to him. He was the guy that successfully led them to the promised land. So that's about leadership succession. Learning how to become redundant. Learning how to give over to someone else. So I want to applaud uh, the ministry for organizing this uh, a talent grooming program because it's a fantastic avenue to start identifying talents and grooming them so that eventually you have a very, very deep bench of people that can succeed in leadership. I lecture twice a year at Harvard Business, uh, Harvard School of, uh, the interesting thing is half of the people that lecture there who have been lecturing them twice a year from uh, 2014 right up to now. In fact, this uh, next month I'll be going back there. Mati Linsky is one of the, uh, the professors there at the program. And uh, by the way, the program is attended only by ministers of health, ministers of finance, ministers of uh, economic planning, and so ministers of education. And this whole program is sponsored by Warren Buffett, and Big Win Philanthropy, and also uh, Bill Gates. So we bring all the ministers from around the world and we, we teach them for about a week, actually. And so Martin Linsky made this very insightful and I would say quite provocative statement. Transformational leadership is about disappointing people at the rate they will permit you to. Because in introducing change, they will be disappointed with you. So your job is not to make them clap hands, but to make them understand. Make them know why the change is necessary. But do not wait for them to applaud you because that will not happen. So if you wait for them to applaud you for the change process that you're going to introduce, more likely you're going to fail and become an ordinary leader. You have to be prepared to disappoint people at the rate they can absorb. They can absorb it if you explain it to them. The fifth secret of leadership is about winning coalition. The tool that I use always in the things that I do is to run labs. That means get the best brain and the brightest people inside the organization, put them in a room, give them the data, give them the challenge, and tell them, I want solutions and I want detailed program. How to solve this problem? 
lab is a tool that really helps to win collision. People work in silos, but if they're inside the lab, the silo is broken. They are forced to come together and be objective. And I, I like the lab because normally if you meet for an hour or two to discuss a problem, a lot of the solutions are opinions of people. They're not fact-based. In the lab, we spent six weeks looking at the data, looking at the evidence. So cannot, you cannot come with solution that is because you are the loudest person in the crowd, you then have monopoly over solutions. So the data must speak for themselves, must inform you what solutions are needed to do that. And because you have a lot of people inside the room, normally about 60 people, you have a lot of clever ideas that come out uh, to, to break down the silos. We have open days, so when you finish doing the lab, you have to exhibit it to show it to people so that people will know what you're going to do, how you're going to do it. And so when we did the um, economic transformation program in government, there were 13,000 Malaysians that came to the open day. And when we did the GTP, the government transformation program, the 8,500 people that came, you can see the crowd there. And, and there was so much support from the, from the people for what we were trying to do. You can see some of the things that they, they loved the MRT because the idea was it came from the lab. We wanted to build the MRT. There were a lot of people that liked it, but there were a few people that didn't like it because the MRT was running through their area. And some of them, they were, they were too close. We have to, uh, we have to buy the property in order to compensate them for doing. There was always resistance to some of the things that you do, for example. The last thing I want to talk about is this idea of divine intervention. This is a bit philosophical. The reason why I say it's a bit philosophical in leadership is this. Leaders must realize that they or human beings have limited control over what happens to them. If you don't believe me, I'd ask you to today to take a piece of paper, write all the big things that happen in your life on that sheet of paper and ask the question, did this happen exactly the way they did because you caused it to happen, yes or no? If it's yes, put a tick. If it's not, put an X and count them. On my sheet, 60% of the things that happened to me have nothing much to do with me. They happened the way they did. For example, I had planned to be a lawyer when I grew up as a kid. All I wanted to do was study hard and be a lawyer. But because I come from the jungle of Borneo, I told them, if you give me the offer to go and do law and the scholarship, please do not send it to the jungle of Borneo. We don't have P.O. box there. Please send it to my auntie. Unfortunately, she was holidaying in Europe. And by the time I got the letter of offer, I was supposed to go to New Zealand to go and do law. And I was late by one day, actually. So I didn't go to New Zealand. I was distraught. My whole life as a student, all I wanted to do was to be a lawyer. I, I could not do that. So I ended up going to a, a Penang, actually. But that was the best thing that happened. Because if I didn't go to Penang, I wouldn't have met my wife. And if I didn't meet my wife there, then we would not have our two boys, our two sons. You see how things have changed. And most likely, if I had gone out to do law, I'd probably be a convincing lawyer in Miri today. And so how life has changed. And uh, the second idea of the uh, human paradigm is that life is a continuous reduction of options. Some of you may remember when we were young. We were so small. Somebody asked you the question, what is your ambition in life? You probably will say on the same day, I want to be a fireman or firewoman. You might say, I want to be a medical doctor on the same day as well. In the afternoon, you say you want to be a rock star. In the same evening, you also say you want to be a, an engineer. Everything is possible. But as you grow a little older, you realize certain things. For example, if you don't good in maths, suddenly the option of becoming a doctor is not there for you. The option of becoming an engineer is not there for you too. Even the option of becoming a dentist is also not there. And I don't know for the life of me, I don't know what pulling teeth got to do with maths. But the point is, life is a continuous reduction of option. Even when you get there, they ask you only do one degree. You can do 10 degrees. When you come out, 
you want to join the red race, you want to find a job. You can't say I want to work for Maybank at the same time I want to work for Hong Leong Bank or CIMB Bank, cannot one. When you get married, also option reduce. So life is a continuous reduction of option. Now, I put it to you as potential leaders and leaders in your own right. If you have two human paradigm that is experientially true, the first being that human beings have limited control over them, and the second one being life is a continuous reduction of option. Our scope for making real change is very limited. Now, who is in charge of life? Some of you may say it's fate. Some of you may say it's God. Some of you may say it's luck. If you go to Lillian Tu, she will say it's Feng Shui. But whatever it is, we are not in charge of life. Why is this important for leadership? Because leadership must understand vulnerability is a virtue. You must know that the world is not at your feet. You cannot control the world. The world cannot say, I don't want pandemic, so it will not come. I don't want COVID, and it will not come. So there are many things outside your control. You can control only the things that are in their 40%. And why is this important? Because then you become humble. Pride is one of the biggest fault of many great leaders. Humility is a very important thing that comes in leadership because if you're humble and you accept that you're vulnerable, you don't control the world, then you don't shoot yourself if you don't succeed. If you fail, it's okay. If, you, if your staff fail, as long as they've done their best, it's okay. So make sure that you do your best and if you fail, it's okay. And so uh, that is why I believe in, in that. Lastly, I want to... Uh, make the comment about us being good human beings. Leaders must be good human beings. Never do bad things. And if you do bad things, bad things will come back to you. And in leadership, we deal with ethics. The things that are, I call it gray. Picture there are three circles. Black means the corrupt, the illegal things to do, the wrong things to do. The white circle is the one that's right, that is proper, that's good, Unfortunately, there's this thing called the gray circle. It's not exactly wrong, it's not exactly right, but it's not exactly illegal, not exactly legal, but it's called ethics. How do you deal with ethical issues? This is very important for leadership. You make ethical judgment based on your conscience. Never decide alone by yourself, because one conscience is not good enough. So my suggestion is, in dealing with ethical issues, bring this ethical issue to a group of people. In my case, when I was uh, in management, I brought it to the board and my management team. Then we discuss it. We look at the options available and write the facts of the case on a piece of paper. Write all the facts of the case on a piece of paper. Write all the options is available and the pros and cons. And then when you conclude that one of the options is the best option, then you ask the litmus test question. The litmus test question is this. If this document is leaked in the social media, can you defend your decision, yes or no? If you cannot defend it in the public arena, then clearly that's a wrong ethical decision. So always use the trick of Never decide ethical issues alone. Bring it to a group of people. Ask the question if the document depicting how you're going to deal with the ethical issues is leaked in the social media, can you defend yes or no? And the last point in leadership is go self-renewal. Always take time away from your work in solitude to reflect on yourself. I use this, uh, this technique for more than 30 years in my whole life. Once in two weeks, I sit quietly in a corner by myself, thinking about what I have been doing over the last two weeks. What have I done right? What have I probably areas for improvement? Because if we don't look at ourselves in the mirror, we never make improvements. So always look at yourself in the mirror and ask critical questions.
because we become very blind to our own things. And I want to, since I'm here, I want to share one slide that give you my thoughts on some of things that you might need to look at for dealing with uh, Malaysian healthcare. And I believe there are six priorities, very important. Huh? The first one is that there need to be an emphasis on uh, non-communicable diseases because I know that Malaysia is one country where we have very high incidence of NCDs. The facts are very clear. We should place much greater emphasis on primary health care. And if we don't do this, it's going to cost us a lot more money in, in dealing with secondary health care in the hospital, in the clinic treatment. But if you help people much earlier on in doing primary health care, there's tremendous improvement and it will save us costs in the long run. The second one is about the financial sustainability of our current model. I am of the view that the current healthcare model in Malaysia is unsustainable. I remember the one ringgit hospital charge was pegged in the year 1982. That was the year I joined Shell, actually. I remember it very well. Think about inflation, how it has moved since. And we've not even increased it by half a cent or even one cent. And so we cannot continue to have the model as the way it is today. We have to bring it much closer to the market so that the level of subsidy is reduced. And I think it's also important for Malaysia to look at national medical insurance. There are so many countries in the world that move there because when you pull the risk together, the premium and the cost associated with pulling it is much, much reduced. So I really believe it's important for Malaysia to think, think very hard about a national medical insurance and at the same time, uh, gradually making increases in the hospital, government hospital and medical charges, bringing it closer to the market. The third area is that changing demography. We have to manage an aging population. There's a lot more older people in Malaysia that are having, we have a huge problem on seniors living. Our, our standard of seniors living, the healthcare that we give, all folks home is completely way behind what, we, what we, we require for this country at our level. So I think a lot of need to be made here, how to deal with an aging population in Malaysia. So the fourth area is about accelerating digital transformation. You have to implement a framework, a very firm framework for end-to-end -end digitalization of healthcare from every aspect of the customer patient journey to everything there. There's a, a lot of things that can be done in this area and they have to move really fast because you don't have to look far. You just have to look at some of the best practices in the world that they do this and copy, cut and paste. The fifth area is to promote public and private healthcare synergy. You know that we have a new mode of collaboration during the pandemic. The COVID pandemic has taught us many things, that there's a lot of synergies that can be obtained if the private sector and the public sector work hand in hand to provide the synergy. But you have to clearly draw the boundaries where they operate. At the same time, Produce the space where there's collaboration between them. And lastly, for the healthcare sector, talent management and professionalism is very key. Adapt international best practices. And uh, as I said, please look at some of the best countries in the world that has the best public healthcare uh, systems in the world. And uh, you look at the way in which they train their, their, their staff talent management, professionalism, and all you need to do is take that and adapt it to the local environment. And I, I think these are one, two, three, four, five, six are my views about what is needed. But you know, the problem is, I don't think this is anything new. You already know this. But the question is, why are we not doing it? It's because we haven't found a way in which we will gather people to come and agree the, the way forward. May I suggest the next step? You conduct a six weeks lab with six work stream. Bringing the best and the brightest people, about 50, 60 people inside each of the work stream from the private sector, from the government and civil society, and bring in the, the various agencies that involve in figuring out solutions. You don't have to wait for six months, six weeks is needed. In six weeks, we will have answers to this. 
We had answers to how to deal with NCDs, how to deal with financial sustainability, how to deal with an aging population, how to deal with digital transformation, how to deal with the public uh, private healthcare synergy, how to deal with tenant management in six weeks. Once you finish the six weeks, the lab recommendations should be presented to the, uh, uh, the YB Minister of Health, your KSU or DG, and also the cabinet for approval and, uh, and the PM, obviously. And this is very important. And if you don't do this, you will never move the pieces forward. Anyone that has bright individual ideas by themselves are never going to get a full support for it because you need the support from everybody. And that's why I really recommend if you did this, you don't wait for six months, you only do it in six weeks. You don't need six, six months. A lot of people say, we form a steering committee and let's now figure out how to do it. Steering committee and also uh, the committees that do this take uh, too long a time and they don't break the silos. And I really believe if you were to do this, you will make great improvement. Thank you very much for the opportunity of sharing.